Hey, I'm Stephanie, and it's time for a deep dive review of the new Couture Mini Clutch eyeshadow palettes from YSL. We will be taking a very close look at all six of the palettes that I have from the permanent line, and I will be sharing my thoughts on them in the form of swatches, application footage, wear tests, and comparisons. Comparisons both within the line itself and amongst other brands so that you can see if one of these palettes might be for you, and if so, which one. I have really put these palettes through their paces over the past 10 days, and I have some very good things to say about them, but also some very important caveats, so if you want to know all the details, buckle in. As always, I'll leave timestamps so that you can easily find whatever information is most relevant for you, and now we're going to just jump right in. First off, let's just briefly discuss the packaging because, let's face it, it does at least look incredibly luxurious with the textured surface, the classic logo, and even the stitching detail all reminiscent of YSL's quilted Y style bags. These palettes open easily, they click closed, and stay closed, and they feel weighted without being too heavy and just in general feel quite luxe. That is, of course, until the eyeshadows fall out. Luckily, that only happened with one of the palettes I received, the Stora Dolls 100 palette. And the pans just happened to fall into my lap, so there was no tragic loss of eyeshadow, and it is something that can be easily fixed with a spot of glue. However, at a luxury price point like these, I don't necessarily feel like the eyeshadows should be falling out of it the second time you open it. As with anything else in life, there can always be flukes, and it might have just been a fluke with the palette I received. However, that was what I was hoping until I saw another review this morning by another YouTuber named Beauty and Some Beasts, and I noticed that she had the exact same problem with her Stora Dolls 100 palette. Oh, well, hold on. I flipped it over to flip out the brushes and the whole little quad came out. And so that kind of makes me wonder if that's an issue with this particular colorway. So if that's the colorway you choose, I would be careful when opening it. And you can always just simply repair it with a bit of glue or of course, exchange it with your retailer. Second, let's talk formulas. Across all of these palettes, there seem to be four formulas, mattes, satins, sequin shadows, and glitter toppers. For anybody who just wants the briefest of summaries, the matte shadows are so soft, smooth, and creamy to the touch, but they're definitely powders. They blend so easily and beautifully. They leave absolutely no fallout, and I do really think they earn the title of luxury eyeshadow. The satins, same thing. Oh my goodness, they are so smooth, so glorious. They have less intensity, but they are very mature eyeshadow friendly and also earn the title of luxury makeup. As for the sequin shades, I feel like they're pretty inconsistent across the palettes, and to be honest, they were the least impressive of all the formulas. Although they feel quite luxurious to the touch, I think the way they apply can look a little bit dry, a little bit flaky, even a little bit scaly depending on the one you're using, and they also leave fallout. Then there's the glitter toppers. They are so shiny and mature eye friendly, but they have real potential for atomic level fallout. But if you're here for more detail, let's start by talking about the mattes. Every single one of these palettes has at least one matte, and I feel like Every single one of those colors performs consistently across the board. They feel so soft, they blend out so smoothly, and they feel like unbelievably creamy mousse to the touch. But although they feel like creams, they most definitely are powders, as can be seen by the amount of kick up in the pan when using them with a brush, and also in how dusty the palettes look even after just using them just once. Yes, there's a lot of kick up, yes, they're powdery, and it is noticeable, but I don't feel like it's out of hand. As long as I go in with a light touch with my brush, I really don't mind. It doesn't bother me, especially when I see how lovely the end result is on the eye and the fact that there is no fallout. The matte formula never looked patchy, it never looked heavy, it never caused any fallout, and it was so easy to get a seamless blend to create beautiful, soft, blown-out looks or a classic smoky eye. 
Due to the softness of the formula, it's not particularly well suited to creating very structured looks, but I do imagine if you were to use tools such as stencils or tape to cover up certain areas of skin that you would be able to achieve a more structured effect that way. And I also think that a cut crease look could be quite impactful with these. I don't try that sort of thing because my eye shape would just make it impossible. But because of the nice soft blend of the mattes and the impact of those toppers, I think just, you know, doing a blown out look and then cutting that crease and adding some topper over it would just be beautiful. The satin formulas also performed consistently across all the palettes. Although I did find that there was a slight difference in the intensity of the pearlescence or the sheen between some of the colors. For example, the taupe satin shade in the Stora Dolls 100 palette seemed more intense to me than the satin peachy shade in the Spontanea Lilies 600 palette. But just like the mattes, these formulas felt unbelievably creamy, although a little bit thinner and a little bit silkier, but just as luxurious as the mattes. And just as with the matte formula, the satin shades blend beautifully, never leaving any fallout and never feeling heavy on the skin. Plus that pearlescent finish is so friendly for textured or mature eyelids. Aside from the finish, the key difference between the matte and the satin formulas is in their intensity. I feel like it was pretty easy to build up the intensity of the mattes, but the intensity of the satin shades could only be built up to a point. And I feel like that has to do with the actual pearlescence of the formula itself. That light reflecting nature tends to wash out color just a little bit more. So I couldn't build up the intensity quite as much with the satin shadows. But once again, I feel that that's very in line with many of the luxury brands because they're offering a soft, gentle luminescence that's very flattering and has a very subtle effect. Next up are the sequin formulas. I define a sequin eyeshadow as one with a matte or a satin base, and then it has glitter particles sprinkled in here or there, just kind of randomly strewn throughout the formula. Just for your context for this review, I personally have never been a fan of any sequin shadow from any brand in any formula ever, so that is going to be reflected here, that being said, I do feel like this is, objectively speaking, the weakest of the four formulas. All of the sequin shades in these palettes do have a matte or a satin base. So everything that I said about the matte and satins, they do apply to the bases of these formulas. The problem I see with the sequin shadows is the fact that they added glitter. And the reason behind that is because one of the most luxurious things about these palettes is the soft smoothness of the mattes, the soft pearlescence and luminescence of the satins. But then those glitters just kind of ran Randomly interrupt that smoothness, adding texture where I feel like it just objectively shouldn't be there, especially because it's so random. And to be honest, to me, it looks a little bit like fairy dandruff. Every time I used one of the sequin shades, I felt like the glitters looked unintentional, sloppy, and sometimes they even had the potential to make the eyeshadow look dry and flaky, even though it didn't feel dry or flaky at all. Plus, the glitters in this formula leave fallout, both during application and throughout the day. And for some reason, the glitter in this formula is particularly tenacious, and I had to be pretty darn aggressive when I tried to remove it. That all being said, I don't feel that the formulation of the sequin shades was consistent across all of the palettes. For me personally, the worst offender was the sequin shade in the Spontanea Lilies 600 palette. When I applied that, I felt like it made my slightly textured eyelids look scaly and flaky. And it reminded me a lot of that shade from the Gucci Beauté de Sears palette, the one that nobody liked, also a pink shade, left a lot of glitter fallout, just looked dry on the eye, made your eyelids look kind of crusty, that shade. And it's funny to me because I feel like so many indie brands and much less expensive brands, like even ColourPop, have had such success with formulating shades like that. So it is a little bit amusing to see the high fashion houses really struggling to formulate something that I feel like everybody else on the market mastered years ago. When it came to the dark sequin shadow in the Babylon Roses palette, I felt like the base color of that shade is just so gorgeous and it performs so beautifully. But then those random gold glitters, I feel like they just interrupt that smoothness and it just ends up looking unintentional every time. 
The best sequin shade formula, in my opinion, was the champagne shade from the Stora Dolls 100 palette. And the reason that I think this particular one works best has to do with the combination of the colors, but also with the finish. The base of this one is a satin, which is giving you more sheen, and I feel like there aren't quite as many glitters in it, and that helps. But I think the main reason that this one functions the best is because the base shadow is essentially exactly the same color as the individual glitters, so they're just not as is noticeable, and I feel like that lack of contrast really works in this particular formula's favor. Although I wasn't a fan of the sequin shadows, I did want to give them a fair shot, and so I tried them out with a bunch of different brushes, and I felt that I could definitely get a dramatically better application depending on the brush I used. And the brush that worked best for me by far with the sequin shadows was the Isom 23 brush, which I believe is a sable hair brush. So brushes definitely do matter, at least with this particular formula. But let's end our discussion of formulas on a high note with the glitter toppers. In my first impressions video, I had mentioned that the glitter topper formula feels a little bit dry and thin to the touch, which might initially sound unappealing, but I actually found that it was a very good formula for textured crepey eyelids. I feel like I'm the ideal candidate to test these sorts of formulas because I have one relatively smooth eyelid and one that's textured and crepey. And I can say that I felt like the glitter toppers looked just as beautiful on either eye. Just like the matte and satin formulas, I feel like the glitter topper formula is also pretty consistent across all of the palettes that contain a glitter shade. Some of the bases are completely transparent transparent, while others offer a very sheer veil of color. Um, and I do feel that the color of the glitters does impact the shine in some cases, but no matter which palette you choose, if you choose one with a glitter topper, you're going to get a shade that gives you a gorgeous, delicately textured, impactful, yet sophisticated shine. However, that shine comes at a price. Fallout. I briefly touched on the fallout that I got with the sequin shadows, but I feel like the fallout I get from the glitter toppers is a bit different. The fallout that I got with the sequin shadows wasn't quite as dramatic, simply because there's not as much glitter in the formula, but man, were those little sequins tenacious. I felt like I had to really scrub my face to get them off. The fallout with the glitter toppers, on the other hand, can be more dramatic simply because there's more glitter in the formula overall, but I did feel like the glitter fallout was easier to remove. Easy being a relative term, I guess, because it wasn't the type of fallout that I could simply whisk away with a powder brush. I did have to use a cotton round with some micellar water in order to wipe the glitters away. Meaning, if you want to use one of the glitter toppers, I definitely advise doing your eye makeup first so you can get rid of any of the fallout before you do the rest of your face. Also, I found that I personally got the best results with the glitter toppers when I used them in conjunction with a glitter primer and also applied them using a silicone applicator. And when I used this, I used a patting motion instead of a swiping motion, and it resulted in a lot less fallout and a gorgeous look every time. And that makes this the perfect time to talk about wear. Any time I wore one of the glitter toppers or sequin shades, I did end up with glitter fallout on my face. I got less of it when I used a glitter primer, but it was inevitably there by the end of the day, just staring back at me from my cheeks. Now, for me personally, that wasn't a huge issue because I'm going more for that, you know, rock star fresh off the tour bus look, and I felt like it was a particularly glamorous way of looking disheveled. But if you're more into pristine looks, I don't know that the glitter toppers or sequin shades will be for you. Also, these palettes quite literally claim on the outer packaging, long wear and comfort. That's a quote. Now, when it comes to comfort, I can definitely vouch for that. These are very lightweight, comfortable shadows. What I'm not 100% convinced with is the long wear claim. I'm maybe like 80% convinced of that, and here's why. Strike one against the long wear claim is the glitter fallout. If glitter is falling down onto my cheeks throughout the day, then it's not wearing longly on my eyelids. 
Strike two against the longwear claim was the fading. The matte and satin shades definitely faded throughout the day, and I would normally start noticing it about hour four or five, which isn't very long wearing to me. I am wearing palette 200 on my eyes today. I've had it on for about 10 hours now, and I'm filming this in natural light. Not sure if you can see, but I definitely have some glitter fallout under the eyes. I didn't use a glitter primer today. I used the uh, MAC Paint Pot on this eye and the Laura Mercier Caviar Stick on this eye. Um, and you know, I feel like the eyeshadow still looks good. It hasn't creased or anything, but I do feel like it fades evenly, but it fades. So I'm not quite sure what to think of the long wear claim. Uh, because you know, my eyeshadow does look good. It just doesn't look like it did when I applied it. To be fair, they faded evenly. Uh, they never looked patchy or haphazard. I never found a bald spot on my lids, not even at the very end of the day. So they faded beautifully, they faded gracefully, but they faded nonetheless. But in the interest of fairness and transparency, the weather during my 10 days of testing was extremely hot and humid and I became a very sweaty person. Plus, I have deep set, partially hooded, oily eyelids. And all of these factors together make me particularly susceptible to things like fading and creasing. And I have to say that although the eyeshadows faded, gracefully, but faded, they only creased on one occasion, and that was almost miraculous. So that's why I say I'm like 80% convinced of that long wear claim. And had I tested these in the winter, maybe I would have even been 100%. No, 90, because the glitter fallout, that would happen any time of year. So now that we've talked about this line in general, let's take a closer look at the individual palettes and some swatches and comparisons. Let's start with palette 100, Stora Dolls. The glitter topper has a very sheer, warm base color. For reference, this shade sits comfortably between Dior's Beige Mitza Single Shadow and Urban Decay Space Cowboy. Dior's Beige Mitza Shadow is a bit warmer. It has a much beefier base and it's much less glittery. So in general, it's a more subtle shadow. While Urban Decay Space Cowboy has a brighter, cooler toned glitter. But all three, I think, are quite related. The Stora Dolls glitter shade creates an almost wet effect on the lids thanks to its combination of a sheer, slightly warm base with cooler, reflective glitters. The Champagne shade is a sequin shadow, and although I really am not a fan of this formula of shadow from any brand ever, I do have to say that this particular version of it might be the least of all evils. And I think that's because the glitter particles are the same color as the base. So although the perfect sheen of that beautiful base is interrupted by those glitters, all in all, it's still a pretty shadow. And that's a lot coming from someone who really can't stand sequin shades. The taupe satin shade is soft and buttery and leaves the most even beautiful sheen across the lid. Personally, I would have preferred if it was a matte shade simply because I tend to use that type of shade, that tone, that depth of shade to contour my heavy brow bone. And a matte shade is ideal in my case because I'm trying to create the illusion that my brow bone is less prominent than it is. And when there's a sheen to a formula like that, it kind of defeats the purpose because it then it ends up reflecting more light and almost makes it more prominent from some angles. So it's not ideal for me, but I have to say, objectively, it is a gorgeous shadow. And if you don't have the same skin tone as I do or the same kind of facial issues that I do, then you might fall in love with that one. The dark chocolate brown shade is the only matte in this palette. And luckily, the quality is such that it's very easy to manipulate. It's very easy to blend. It doesn't get stuck anywhere. And that means that I can easily use it as a contour shade. And that's what I did today. So who is this palette for? I would say cool tone lovers, people who love a cool tone smoky eye, but you have to like a shiny eye because with only one matte shade in the palette, you're gonna kind of get shine everywhere. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I noticed that when I used the satin taupe shade in the crease, and then I used the champagne sequin shade as my highlight, my eyes looked almost sweaty, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, sometimes that's exactly the sultry look I'm going for, but not always. So it's just something to keep in mind. But hey, if you are going for the sweaty eye look, 
this palette's right for you. I tried to find some comparable palettes to kind of give you a frame of reference and see if you might already have something similar in your collection. Tom Ford's Nude Dip was probably the closest that I found for the mood because both are cool toned neutral palettes and both can give you that very sweaty, sultry look because of the finishes. But I think the Natasha Denona Mini Glam or Midi Glam palettes might come closer color wise and finish wise since the Tom Ford palette only offers those shimmery wet dry formula finishes. Now let's take a closer look at palette 200, Gilly's Dream. The glitter topper in this particular palette has a completely transparent base and a mixture of different color glitter particles. Some are warm gold and some are pink. And that combination results in a warm sunset gold. The pale peach shade in here looks peachy in the pan, but it applies more as a rosy pink on the skin. And just like the rest of the matte formulas, it's unbelievably smooth, soft, buttery, creamy, and blends like a dream. The muted red shade has just a hint of brown, making it lean more neutral than it otherwise could have. All in all, this color story is extremely cohesive and much more neutral friendly than I would have expected based on the promotional pictures. So who is this palette for? If you love your neutrals and are shy when it comes to color, but you're kind of interested in expanding your horizons, if you enjoy the shades in here, I think this might actually be the palette for you because it's a little bit more neutral leaning than I initially thought. Even now looking at it in person, it doesn't seem like it would be all that neutral, but on the eye itself, um, I felt like it was colorful for me. I'm a neutral girl, but I definitely felt comfortable wearing this. With only the best of the YSL formulas in here, namely the mattes and that glitter topper, you can get beautifully rosy blown out looks with this, with of course the added impact of that glitter. When it comes to comparisons, I think my Tom Ford Honeymoon palette probably comes the closest color wise, but the finishes in the Tom Ford palette are all shine with no matte options. So I actually think these two palettes would be great companions for each other. Other than that, I didn't really find all that much in my collection that was all that close. My Clinique The Best of Black Honey palette had similar vibes, but is ultimately a very different palette and much more cool toned. The new Nudes palette from Huda Beauty has a lot of similar options, but I wouldn't call these palettes dupes because I feel like Galee's Dreams is the more neutral version, plus you get more depth in Galee's Dreams. But if you're just kind of looking for a general vibe, if you already have the Huda New Nudes palette, I don't think you would need Galee's Dreams. Moving on to the 300 Casbah Spices palette, when we look at the glitter topper in here, this one also has a completely transparent base, but it only has one shade of glitter in it, and that is neutral gold. The cream color is a matte shade and can be used as a matte highlight instead of the glitter to create a softly contoured look if you're not in the mood for shine on a particular day. The burnt peach shade is a mid-toned matte that worked well for me in the crease, helping me to shape my eye while also adding a very subtle pop of color. The neutral dark brown matte shade could easily be built up in intensity and was extremely easy to blend out. So who is this palette for? It is a warm leaning neutral lover's dream. And if you're anything like me and your beiges, bronzes and browns are your babies, then this palette is right up your alley. But if you're anything like me, then you already have this color story probably at least two times over. So I would say if you are someone who is particularly interested in formulas and textures, this one might be worth trying or at least swatching in store because it definitely has the best of what YSL seems to offer. If on the other hand, you're only really interested in the colors, but you already have something similar, then I think you could pass on this one. When it came to comparison palettes for this one, the very first one that popped into my head was Tom Ford Suspicion, which I think from the colors is very similar, but it's very different, of course, from the finishes. But I do feel like that makes them great companion palettes for one another. Another palette that popped into my head was Tom Ford's De La Creme, and those are a little less similar color-wise. They're still related though, but they're more similar finish-wise, and I think that makes them less suitable as companion palettes for one another. If 
If you already have the Tom Ford Della Creme palette, I don't know that you would need this one, although the formulas are very different. Where um, the Casba Spices palette is very creamy and smooth, you can get more intensity with this one. The Tom Ford Della Creme palette, I think it shines in its subtlety. That formula is extremely finely milled, but also very hard pressed. So it's hard to get a lot of impact. You, it's almost impossible to overdo that palette. Um, this one is, is different. It's a little bit more dramatic. I also looked at my Natasha Denona palettes and I found that the mini nude and camel palettes had certain similarities to this color story. And when you combined those two palettes, I feel like ultimately you could get a very similar look to Casba Spices, even if it's not completely identical. I also thought that the Natasha Denona Biba palette offered some very similar colors, even if the finishes and the textures are, are a little bit different. But if you have any of those Natasha Denona palettes, I think you could get a very comparable look to this. So I don't necessarily know you'd need to run out and pick this one up. Now let's talk about Babylon Roses. The first glitter topper has a very sheer pale pink base with white gold glitters. And the resulting effect is a very pale, sparkling, ethereal pink. The second glitter topper has an ever so slightly more pigmented mauve rose colored base, but it's still very sheer. And the glitters are a mixture of lilac and silver glitter. So also a very ethereal shade. The only matte in the palette is a soft, buttery, dusty rose. And the darkest shade in the palette is a sequin shadow. The base of it is a matte muted purpley mauve. And then it does have kind of coppery gold glitters in it. So who is this palette for? I would say if you're looking for the ethereal option, this is probably the one for you. The delicate pink and purpley sparkles twinkle magically. The muted dusty rose tone grounds the look ever so nicely, while the depths of this shade get a little bit of extra dimension from those coppery glitters. Next, we come to Medina Glow, which out of all of the pinky palettes in this line, this one probably has the most intensity also because it has the most depth. This one also has two glitter shades in it. The lighter of the two has a completely sheer base and a mixture of both champagne and kind of peachy pink glitters. Whereas the darker of the shades does have kind of a rosy sheer base, but the glitters in this one are very multidimensional. I can see pinks, I can see blue, blue, I can see silver, do I see red, do I see purple? There's a lot going on in there, but they're so finely milled in tiny particles that they end up just kind of looking like magical fairy dust. So no matter what color they are, the resulting shade is a rosy, multidimensional, very shiny sort of magical thing. As for the mattes in this palette, both of them are just differing tones of pink, different shades, different depths. Both of them are smooth, beautiful, and buttery. And I do feel like they're very balanced because I feel like in some palettes, like for example, ones from Tom Ford, sometimes I feel like we're getting very similar shades or shades in very similar depths. And this palette here, I feel like is very balanced and you can get a lighter effect or more depth and intensity depending on which shades you choose and how intensely you apply them. When it came to trying to find comparisons for this palette, I'm not sure I found a really good one. I tried comparing it with Charlotte Tilbury's Pillow Talk, um, Lancome's Nude Sculptural Quint, and also Huda Beauty The New Nudes. And I think ultimately Huda Beauty once again is the most similar. And if you do have Huda The New Nudes, I don't necessarily know that you need this one. Um, but if you don't have that one, I do think this is kind of the best of the New Nudes palette. So maybe you would want to get this one instead. Who do I think this palette is for? Well, if you are into pink, this has your name written all over it. Because for me, this is the pinkiest, warmest, most intense palette. We're going to talk about another pink palette next, but that one doesn't have the same intensity. So if you're looking for more of a pop of color and you really want pink, this one might be for you. And last but not least, we have Palette 600 Spontini Lilies. This is also a pink palette from the line, but I feel like it's less intense than Medina Glow, simply because the depth of tone isn't quite as intense. But you still definitely get a very noticeable pop of color with this one. This is also a warm leaning pink palette, but I do feel like every single one of the shades of pink in here 
does have a hint of peach in it. This is the only palette in the line with no glitter toppers. Instead, it has one sequin shadow, two mattes, and a satin. The sequin shadow has a, I would say, like a mauve pink base, but it's pretty sheer actually. The glitters in there though are gold and pink and so you end up getting a pinky shine effect on the eye. The lightest matte in the palette is a very pale pink and that one I think has the most peach in it at least for my eyes. The darkest matte in the palette is a very warm pink. I think it does give a good deal of intensity and the satin shade sits right in the middle when it comes to depth of tone giving a very nice sheen. So I also feel like this palette is very balanced when it comes to depth of tone. When it came to comparisons once again I thought that the Huda Beauty the new nudes palette was the closest that I could get. And if you have the Huda Beauty New Nudes palette, I don't feel like you would need to get this one. When it came to my quads and quince, the closest ones that I could find were Charlotte Tilbury Pillow Talk, Tom Ford Sous Le Sable, and my Lancome Nude Sculptural Quint once again. But of course, none of them were a perfect dupe for this palette. I feel like this one was more colorful than any of those. So who is this palette for? If you are very into pink, but you don't want the drama of the glitter topper, and you don't want a whole lot of depth, then this might be the palette for you. I do feel like it's very well balanced when it comes to depth of tone and intensity. Um, so you're gonna get a very balanced look with this, but it's not going to have the same intensity as say Medina Glow. When it comes to comparisons within the Couture Mini Clutch line itself, none of these palettes is particularly shocking color-wise, but some are more neutral than others. The first three palettes in the line, Stora Dolls 100, Galee's Dreams 200, and Caspa Spices 300 are the most neutral. Stora Dolls leans cool, Galee's Dreams leans red, and Caspa Spices leans warm. The remaining palettes I have are still more or less neutral friendly. Babylon Roses 400 is the mauve purple option, Medina Glow 500 is the intense pop of pink, and Spontini Lilies is the lighter, peachier pink option. If you're trying to choose between the reds and the pinks, I think that Galee's Dreams 200 probably has the most nuance and is the most neutral option of the three. Medina Glow 500 is definitely the most saturated pink option, and Spontini Lilies 600 is the lightest, slightly peachy option. So do I think the YSL palettes deserve the title of luxury makeup? I think so. There's something very special about these formulas, especially the mattes and the satins. There's something about the way they feel when you touch them that's a little bit magical. And the glitter toppers, although they can be tricky because of the fallout, they are beautiful and they do offer a sophisticated, delicate sparkle. So if you're into intensity, that is a nice way to go. It's more intense than some of the luxury palettes out there when it comes to glitter, but I have to say, I think they've balanced it well. So how does this compare to other luxury formulas? Well, the fact that you can get such a soft blown out look with these, I think speaks for itself that it's very luxurious in that way. But when it comes to specific formulas, I feel like um, Tom Ford's current matte formula, the one that you might find in De La Creme or Sous Le Sable, those are extremely finely milled. So they're very soft, but they're hard pressed, meaning it's hard to get a whole lot of pigmentation on your brush and you're gonna get a much more subtle effect on the eye. You are gonna get more impact with these. I have been asked how this compares to the Tom Ford cream formula because both formulas feel like creams but are actually powders and I have to say they feel very different. The Tom Ford formula feels much thinner, almost more like a serum, whereas this feels much beefier. This actually feels like moussey and there's something very satisfying about touching these. When it comes to the Natasha Denona cream to powder formulas, I find these much easier to use. With Natasha Denona, I find that I usually have to have a plan for how I'm going to place those shadows because once I've placed them, I can't necessarily manipulate them exactly where I want them to go if I change my mind. Whereas this formula is so easy to manipulate, I feel like I could just kind of blend it any which way I wanted to go. So these are more beginner friendly, more user friendly in general. That's not to say I don't like the Natasha Denona cream to powder formulas, I just think it, they're a little bit more cerebral than these. 
When it comes to Dior shadows, I have to say my experience with them is limited, but I feel like Dior shadows in general are more in line with what I would typically think of powder eyeshadows. They're not particularly creamy. Um, the finishes are normal. Um, and so as beautiful as the ones I've used are, I never necessarily felt like they felt magical. The tactile experience wasn't something that was particularly original. Whereas these, I feel like are kind of taking textures in a new direction and it feels refreshing. Are these palettes dark skin friendly? As important as that question is, it's difficult for me to answer because I'm not a makeup artist and this is pretty much the only skin tone I have any experience with. So what I will do is I will see if I can find anyone with dark skin who has reviewed these palettes. And if I can find any reviews, I will be sure to list them in the description box with a link so that you can find them. That being said, I did see some of the promotional photography for these palettes and there is a blue palette, which I do not have. And the model for that palette had dark skin and that palette really popped. When it comes to the other palettes, I'm not so sure how the colors would work. Knowing what I know of the opacity and buildability of the mattes and the intensity of the glitter toppers, I do feel like maybe Medina Glow would have potential because there's a certain degree of brightness and intensity to this palette that I think could also pop nicely on darker skin tones. But as I said, my experience is limited, so you have to take what I say with a grain of salt. And the question every review tries to answer is this worth it? And the answer is, it's hard for me to say because I don't know what your budget is, if you have certain holes in your makeup collection that you're trying to fill, or what your particular personal preferences are. What I can say is that if you do not like glitter fallout, these palettes are not for you. Um, but if you're into textures, if you don't mind glitter fallout, and if you love a tactile experience, these palettes are very interesting. As far as my favorite ones or least favorite ones, the one that I was gravitating to the most, other than of course Casba Spices because that is my personal colorway, but um, the one that I actually was most interested in other than that was number 600 Spontini Lilies because I just thought the pinks in there would be really fun. And the matte and satin shades were, but that sequin shade I think is, is a fail in that palette. The other sequin shades I can live with, but that one I just really didn't like. And so for me personally, um, Spontini Lilies isn't a palette that I would recommend just because I personally think that one whole quarter of the palette is a bust. But if you like sequin shades, then, you know, who am I to say that you wouldn't like it? So I think out of all the palettes, number 600 is the one I'd recommend the least. Casba Spices, I think, was my personal favorite. But if you're looking for neutral palettes, I think the 100 Stora Dolls, um, 200 Gillies Dreams and 300 Casba Spices, all three of them offer great options. And so, um, you know, I would at least just go take a look at them in store if you're interested. Swatch them, see how you feel about the glitter fallout, you know, really weigh it because, you know, these aren't cheap. So, did any of these palettes catch your eye? If so, which one? Inquiring minds want to know. Also, if you have any questions about the formula, the quality, or the color stories, please just feel free to ask in the comments. If you thought this video was helpful, please give it a thumbs up because that helps other people find it. And if you enjoy makeup reviews and comparisons, then perhaps you want to consider subscribing because that's what I do here, usually in the context of Adagio Beauty. And if you'd like to see what that looks like, I've got the perfect video for you right here. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great week and that we can all remember that even stumbling can be a form of moving forward. So let's stumble in style. <laughs>